Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. A somber moment, tears and hugs as family and friends come together to remember a man killed during a fire in his own restaurant. And a body found in the Guadalupe River. The circumstances surrounding this man's death unknown. His mother now pleading with anyone with any information to speak up as she searched for closure. But first, a youth soccer coach arrested on allegations of child sexual abuse. Tonight, Universal City police are concerned about other possible victims. The night team's Patty Santos with details on this arrest. Juan uh, Coronado. League is up. Uh, uh, Coronado Foot. Universal City Police say the coach and founder of Coronado Foot Academy was booked into the Bear County Jail on two felony counts of continuous sex abuse of a child. The details in his arrest warrant are too graphic to share, but the victims, who are relatives, explain the abuse was ongoing for several years. Another concern that we had that ran ancillary to this investigation was how far this reached, how far it expanded, and um, and getting notice to that soccer league as he was the director, I guess, and and, and uh, founder. 44-year-old Juan Antonio Coronado Jr. is listed on the website as the executive director with experience in several youth soccer leagues dating back to 2005. His website says his academy is for boys and girls ages 9 to 13 years old based in Cibolo. Investigators have informed other league coordinators about his arrest. I ensure that they are they are brought up to speed on this that in case they need to obviously check with their, their children and others that could have been impacted. Tonight, UC police want parents to have a candid but important conversation with their children. I encourage your children and, and those uh, in that league to, to speak out if anything uh, transpired. Be open with your children. Let, no, make it a safe environment for them to talk to you and tell you things and, and stay engaged in their lives. And I spoke with a couple of parents who have kids in that league. They were just finding out about the arrest and uh, they tell me they were disgusted, but also very concerned about these allegations. Tonight, Coronado sits in the jail right behind me, facing a $200,000 bond, and police say more charges could be filed. Jackie, Steve. Parents have to be shocked. Thank you, Patty. A sad discovery and new developments tonight. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office confirming the victim from the fire at Sergio's Molino restaurant was, in fact, the owner, 65-year-old Sergio Salcedo. Tonight, a large crowd made it out to the West Side restaurant to hold a vigil in honor of his life. Friends, family, employees all in attendance. The fire broke out Sunday morning. Fire crews had a hard time rescuing Salcedo. They knew he was in there, but due to renovations in the restaurant, they just couldn't get to him. One of the restaurant's employees say, says Salcedo was dedicated to his work. He showed me how to work hard, to be dedicated, and uh, the importance of uh, pleasing his uh, the people he uh, he served yeah he always said that it's not selling a product it's having them to come back serve them good enough so that they want to come back the fire officials say the building is a complete loss the cause of the fire is still unknown new on the night beat a new Braunfels mother is desperate for answers after tourists found her son's body in the guadalupe river at first due to the condition of the body police could not identify him but later learned it was 18 year old jesus miguel romero his mother awaits autopsy results she tells me she just wants to know what happened to her son i can't see him like that but i mean i need to know because if it's not him then i need to go find him but then my heart says it might be him. Rosalia Romero says she still has not seen the body of her son, Jesus Romero, an 18-year-old who New Braunfels police say was discovered along the Guadalupe River near Green Road. Police say tourists at a nearby hotel spotted Jesus' body Friday. Rosalia says the last time she spoke with him was Tuesday morning. When Thursday comes around, all the way from San Antonio to San Marcos, I started calling all the jail houses, all the hospitals. They had no record of him. After trying to report him missing to police, Rosalia says she got a phone call. My daughter calls me and she's just yelling and I was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? She couldn't tell me, but I heard my mom in the background. And she's just like, no, not my papa's. And I knew, I knew something. Police say Jesus had been dead for more than 24 hours. 
Rosalia says her friends last saw him at the Gristmill River restaurant and bar on Green Road, but it's still unclear how he ended up in the river, which is two minutes away. She's left with only memories. Just brighten our day anytime, anytime. Everybody loved him. She says Jesus loved being the man of the household and loved being a tattoo artist. This one, a heart of names, is her favorite. It's the king of my heart, my son. New Braunfels police have not said whether the suspect or they suspect foul play. They say they're awaiting results from Romero's autopsy to determine a cause and manner of death. With more than 800 COVID patients hospitalized in Bexar County, it is having a major impact on how hospitals operate. We spoke with the head of the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, or STRAC, who says area hospital operations are stressed along with their staff. For example, if an emergency room is overwhelmed, they can request new patients be put on what they call diversion somewhere else. But if too many in one area request diversions, that can be overridden. Diversion override means everybody's on divert and everybody's going to have to be open because the ambulances have to have somewhere to go. The solution to the squeeze is getting more staff in place to deal with patients, but that's a problem as well because Epley says there's a nursing shortage. In the meantime, health systems private contracts to bring in temporary staff are helping keep hospital staff stable. And with that stress on hospitals, places like Baptist Health Systems are pushing for people to utilize the tele-emergency rooms. It serves as a virtual ER health evaluation program for adults with non-life-threatening injuries. Services are available for all San Antonio residents and can be done from the comfort of your home. All you have to do is reach out to the number on your screen. So how is someone who makes his living in the emergency room dealing with this latest COVID surge? During our KSAT Q&A at 6, we spoke with Dr. Robert Frolichstein, an ER doctor at Methodist Hospital. He says more than 95% of the people being admitted to the emergency room and admitted to the hospital are unvaccinated. Also, a large portion are people who are younger. He also urged people to get vaccinated and says the idea of the vaccines not working is just not true. I've not seen a single complication of vaccine in my 18 months of doing, or however long the vaccine's been around, nine months, I've not seen one case of someone coming in because of the vaccine caused a problem. It doesn't mean you won't get it. You know, just like the flu, people that get the flu vaccine sometimes will get the flu, but typically the ones that we've seen that have had the vaccine, it's much less severe. As for the symptoms of those being admitted, they're more severe and similar to past surges. Trouble breathing, fatigue, fever, body aches, just to name a few. Underway right now are clinical trials trying to determine if a third booster shot could help slow the spread of COVID-19. Researchers at 12 sites are studying the safety and the body's immune response to a mixed booster shot of one of the three vaccines approved under FDA emergency use authorization by either sticking with the vaccine you originally received or switching to a new one to boost your immunity. So just like with the flu vaccine, you get a dose each year because the variants or the types of influenza change. The concern is that at some point our current vaccinations might not protect us as well as they are doing right now for the variants. The results from the trial are expected by the end of the summer. Researchers say they hope to have FDA emergency approval above before a possible surge in the fall. A good 36 hours of maintenance rain across south and central Texas. I mean, look at the rainfall estimates on the radar. You see these little red areas indicating two to four inches of rain that has fallen. Now, actual rain gauge reports have confirmed a lot of what we see out there. You look north of Del Rio, Devil's River, Del Norte, 2.53. Kickapoo Caverns, almost two inches. Bernie, about an inch. But outside of Bernie, some higher accumulations. Canyon Lake, about a quarter of an inch. But you go over to Spring Branch, and we had one viewer report up to seven inches of rainfall. Officially at the airport, uh, we picked up just over a third of an inch, but you see very healthy rainfall amounts. More rain and rain chances are in the forecast. We're going to time those out for you and jump into the details in a moment. Adam, thank you. Still ahead on the night beat, COVID transmission rates are increasing across the country. The latest numbers and what the Biden administration is planning to do next. And coming up, it's the moment many fans have been hoping for. Simone Biles competing at the Olympics again. 
the event she's in after sitting out for days. Next, after a few days off, the Otis McCain trial is back this week. Who testified today during the punishment phase of the trial? That's next. All eyes are back on the Otis McCain trial after being delayed for two days. McCain was convicted for killing SAPD detective Benjamin Marconi last week. The prosecution attacked McCain's character during the punishment phase of his capital murder trial. One of the witnesses who took to the stand today was his ex-girlfriend and the mother of their son. She testified that McCain was physically and mentally abusive toward her. She said that one of those examples was when he grabbed the steering wheel of her car while she was driving and tried to crash. I was so angry and frustrating that he he threatened to to kill kill me. And not only that, he endangered me and my son. The jury will decide whether McCain will get the death penalty or life in prison without parole. The punishment phase of the trial continues tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. We remind you, you can watch a live stream of the trial on our website at KSAT.com. Cases soaring now. More than 100,000 reported in 24 hours this weekend, the highest since February. Hospitalizations are on the rise and federal disaster teams are stepping in to help. Here's the latest from ABC's Morgan Norwood. As COVID cases soar, healthcare systems feeling the strain. In Louisiana, the state with the highest infection rate in the country, some hospitals now running out of beds. These are the darkest days of this pandemic. We are no longer giving adequate care to patients. In Austin, Texas, officials pleading with pregnant women to get vaccinated. We've all seen over the past several weeks an increase of our maternal moms that are pregnant, ending up hospitalized and ending up in our ICU. Nearly 80% of U.S. counties are reporting high or substantial community transmission. Health officials say the unvaccinated are being overwhelmed by the Delta variant. But despite the alarming surge, White House officials insisting we're not headed toward another lockdown. We're not going back to the shutdowns of March of 2020. Too many people are vaccinated. But we are seeing a wave of mask mandates. In the Bay Area, health officials requiring everyone to wear a mask in indoor public settings, regardless of vaccination status starting Tuesday. And Louisiana reviving its indoor mask requirement. There's a dangerous amount of COVID spreading in Louisiana right now. And when it comes to breakthrough infections, Dr. Anthony Fauci pointing to CDC data showing just 0.01% of those infections after full vaccination led to hospitalization or death. Daryl Baker wishes he would have gotten his shots sooner. I was strongly against getting the vaccine just because we're a strong conservative family. Uh, but that little boy out there is Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Los Angeles. Live cam tonight, taking a look out on the roadways and, you know, it started off rainy, but oh, yeah. cleared up pretty nicely. Yeah, I live on the far west side, so I got lit up by the raindrops earlier. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> there were a lot and there were some areas that got it pretty heavy tonight, too. Yeah, we did. We had some heavy rainfall, especially still ongoing farther south of San Antonio, and this isn't it. We still have some more rain chances in the days ahead and even tomorrow morning, but we really think today was the main event. From here on out, it's going to be the pop up less numerous showers and thunderstorms. However, wherever they pop up, they could quickly drop one to two inches due to this tropical air mass and a decent amount of moisture that's in the air. This is neat. This is interesting. So if you were outside this evening, take a look at this. I climbed up on the KSAT roof. Well, I took the stairs technically, okay? Uh, but you look down to the south and you see the sky lighting up there near the Tower of Americas. That's a thunderstorm that's far off in the distance. And that thunderstorm, you can actually see it from San Antonio this evening. So if some of you are wondering what those flashes in the sky were farther to the south, it was actually this thunderstorm that I was looking at south of Cho Canyon Reservoir, south of Tilden. I mean, it was about 80 miles away when I was taking those pictures. However, it does reach to about 40,000 feet tall. When you look at it and analyze it, it's up to about 40,000 feet tall and even 45,000 feet tall earlier. In turn, we could actually see the lightning from the top of that storm uh, earlier this evening and probably still in some places now as well. If you look down to the south and even southeast, Beeville, seen some heavy rainfall moving through. This is closer to the frontal boundary. It's basically along the frontal boundary that moved through 
our neck of the woods last night and this morning, providing us with the lift that we needed to take advantage of the instability that's in the air and get those showers and storms firing. So here's the rate of satellite and radar over the past 12 hours. Saw the heaviest activity earlier this morning and even before this loop starts in San Antonio. Then this afternoon it was in the hill country and it fizzled out before it made it to San Antonio and Highway 90 because our atmosphere was just kind of worked over and it was fairly stable from the morning showers and storms. So we didn't see much this afternoon, but where we have the boundary down to the south of us, that should be where most of the showers and storms continue to fire up through the night tonight and first thing tomorrow morning. We can't rule out a few popping up here and there, some isolated ones, but most of them should be south of us tonight, kind of like what we see there now, uh, south of Tilden, down near Beeville as well, and some more development here and there in some of our southern counties. Otherwise, rain chances, as we talked about, about 30% going forward, so isolated to widely separated in nature. Officially at the airport, 0.37, so significantly lower than many other area rain gauges. But remember, some folks didn't even get a drop, especially farther south and east of San Antonio in this event. Right now we're at 78, dew point is 71. Feels like 80 degrees out there. And by the way, we, you saw in the previous slide, a high of 87 today. 87, that's what all the extra clouds and the rain will do for us. Early August and our high temperature was 10 degrees below average. Canyon Lake now 75, Hondo 76, Bernie 72, still hanging on to 80 Stinson and Castroville, 83 in Del Rio and 76 in Uvalde. Of course, we have the humidity and the mugginess, dew points, lower 70s. It's that time of year, it's hard to get rid of and shake that humidity, especially with all the rain we just had. This high soil moisture is gonna lead to some very muggy days. Tomorrow, that 20 to 30% chance throughout the day where they pop up, they'll be pretty heavy rainers. And I think slightly higher chances south of San Antonio, 74 in the morning, 92 for the high temperature, and most of us will be right near 90 degrees for the high. We'll be about 89 in Stone Oak, 89 Castroville, New Braunfels, 90 in Elmendorf, right near the 90 degree mark. Notice as we get into the upcoming weekend, temperatures climb a little bit, but we're still only talking mid 90s, you know, about 96 degrees for the high, and the average is 97. So that's just going to get closer to average for this time of year, and still, I mean, Knock on wood, no triple digits in the forecast yet. Well, hey, still with those temperatures, the raindrops will feel really good hitting the face in some 90 degree weather, though. Mm -hmm. Adam. It's for sure. All right, we're less than 24 hours in, what, not even eight hours into free agency, and yeah. the Spurs already have two signings. Well, I think a lot of these teams and we're individuals done and angels, yeah. uh, yeah. agents uh, come into this situation with an idea of what's going to happen on yes. the very first day, and that's exactly what happened, at least for the San Antonio Spurs, who signed two free agents today. One of them an outside shooter. When we come back, we'll let you know who those guys are. And when it comes to Neville Gallimore, not your typical football story of success when we come back. San Antonio Spurs got themselves a shooter in free agency, signing six foot seven Doug McDermott, who has agreed to a three year, $42 million deal with the Spurs. That's according to The Athletic. McDermott is about to start his eighth season in the NBA, averaged 13 and a half points, shot 39% from three point range last season with the Pacers. And Zach Collins has also agreed to a three year, $22 million deal to suit up for the silver and black, according to ESPN. But he does have a history of being injury prone. Camping with KZAP, powered by Davis Law Firm. Join us now from the Dallas Cowboys training camp in Oxnard, California. <clears throat> Defensive tackle, Neville Gallimore. Thank you. <laughs> both cameras, make sure you get them both. <laughs> so I know this is probably going to be an obvious answer from you, but how much different is this year's training camp from last year's training camp? Completely <laughs> different. Man, but in a good way, in a good yeah. way. You know, obviously last year with COVID being at an all-time high and everything being on lockdown, you never really got a chance for that true, you know, football NFL experience. So now being out here in Oxnard, um, it's been great. It's been great. I've been having a lot of fun and this weather, man, I can't beat it. Can't beat it. You <laughs> cannot beat it. Definitely. So did you feel like you were kind of thrown into the fire last year? It's more like, you know, tossed like <laughs> head first uh, into the fire. But it, it was great. You know, it was, I, I kind of like, you know, being in a situation like that, just kind of like, OK, you know, thrown into it. Yeah. Can you hang? Are you going to come out? Yeah. You're going to come out a dog. You're going to come out and be effective or, you know, you're going to are you kind of just going to, you know, be afraid of the moment. And, 
you know, I'm not a guy who ever shies away from, you know, the big moment. But, you know, football, it's, it's st still a game, you know, a game that we love. And, you know, you're growing up playing as a kid. And, you know, when you get to the NFL, you know, it, you know the moment's a little bit bigger. Everybody's watching you. But, but still, it's still just football. And, just reminding myself to enjoy it and have fun with it. And you mentioned that growing up, you know, as a kid, but you kind of got into football a little different way than most people do. Oh yeah, you say? yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, just you know, again, being born and raised in Canada yeah. and playing out there, and then just just the transition, man. Just um, understanding, you know, the just how they play football is different. You know, yeah. just because you know. Just what's required was asked if you just the football, the common knowledge compared to where I played at. A little bit of a transition, but you know, <laughs> did what I had to do to, to get to this and, and point. You started with just a group of friends, right? Yeah, literally, yeah. literally started playing basketball. And then oh, okay. one of my uh, friends now at the time, uh, he was just like, man, come play, come play. And I'm like, okay, I don't sure. know what I'm doing. <laughs> then being in the fourth grade, I guess this dude that was probably four or five years older than me, he had the ball and I just ran through him. It was like, yeah, you should come play for our, our pop on the team. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it might just be kinda, good. Yeah, and then the love was just established right there. So as a kid growing up in Canada, become a fan of Oklahoma, because I understand that was kind of like your target all along. I think it was just destined. It was a funny story. Like, I, I literally remember back in the ninth grade, me, uh, my best friend Derek, and my best friend uh, uh, Nick, we were literally just chilling, Derek's house, watching ESPN All Access. Right. And OU was there, and we spent the whole week watching that, and I was just kind of like, man, like, I don't know about the culture there or what it is, but that would be really cool to to be here, you know, be a Canadian kid, play over there. But in my mind, I'm kind of like, yeah, you know, they're not coming all the way out here to come see me. But, you know, I'm put my head down and, and work. And then literally, fast forward to my senior year, or going into my senior year, they were like the 12th school to offer me. So remember I told my best friends that, and it was kind of like a, you know, a little tears were shared because like, man, talk about speaking something into existence, right? Because all I was around them for was just to get school paid for so my parents didn't have to worry. But right. yeah, God bless you. So man. you were the first Canadian-born player to be invited to the U.S. Army All-American All Bowl, yeah, right? Yes, sir. But I, I didn't get to, to play just because I, I think I hurt my my Achilles that time. But no, nah, just the experience and just, you know, that I feel like that meant a lot for not only for me, but just for the city. Finally, this season, does everybody come in on the defensive side of the ball with a little chip on their shoulder? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, obviously, last season definitely didn't pan out the way we wanted to. And I know the amount of work that the guys have put in, you know, we've been putting in in the offseason and just building that chemistry and just understand we got a lot to prove. Good luck this season. Appreciate you. Thank you. Great guy, great interview, really appreciate that. Neville, here's a look at the Cowboys schedule this week. Practice tomorrow, travel to Canton for the Hall of Fame game Thursday night, 7 p.m. against the dreaded Steelers. Thanks to Neville for signing their camp board. Be used to help raise money for the Society of St. Vincent de Paul that feeds the homeless and the working poor of Bear County back after this. After bowing out of all the Olympic events after her first attempt at the vault did uh, due to mental health issues, Simone Biles has decided to return. USA Gymnastics announcing today that Biles will compete in the balance beam, the last event after pulling out of the team and all of the other individual competition until now. Here's a quick look at the medal count with USA on top of the look at that 22 gold medals, 64 overall, followed by China, 62 overall, 29 gold. Uh, the Russian Olympic Committee, 50 and 12 gold medal, followed by Great Britain and Japan. And I got to say about Simone and what she's been able to do here, we were talking to Dak Prescott about that at the Cowboys training camp about the mental health issues. And she said in her particular case, you really have to give her credit because she could seriously injure herself oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. if she's not focused on what she does, you know, on a lot of what she competes in. So, no, it was mandatory that she feel right. And apparently she feels right enough to compete in the balance speed. And I believe the men's basketball team playing tonight or mm. early morning or, or yes or yes as it transitions so be, over from obviously it's Tuesday already yeah, in Japan so be, yes they're playing tomorrow today it'd be interesting to see how they play <laughs> playing tomorrow today <laughs> we'll makes, be right back makes perfect sense <laughs> That's it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Good night.